Shooby dooby dooby dee, shooby dooby dooby dee. This is a placeholder song, I hope. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to the All Men, the All Moments Eternally Nice podcast. My name is Max Haddad. My dog's name is Nolly. She's sitting beside me. Uh, and welcome. Um, you know, in my old videos, I used to say if uh, something like, if this is your first time, welcome. If you're, if you're returning, welcome back. Something like that. Um, I should remember it because I said it hundreds of times, but I don't. And, um, but I still feel that way. So if you're coming back, thank you for being a return customer. Truly, that's huge. The fact that there is anybody that wants to listen to me more than once, that feels nice. So thank you. If this is your first time, you've probably already clicked away. So I get it, you know, and nothing I'm going to say you're going to hear because you're already gone. But thanks for the thanks for the click anyways. Thanks. I said thanks and I wasn't kidding. I actually just said that. So um, how are you guys? You good? I hope you're good. I'm good. Um, whenever. So on days where I don't have much to do, I get really excited. <laughs> when I wake up. So like, let's say I go to sleep at 2 a.m., which is very late for me. That's not something I do very often. But I know that I don't have anything to do the next day, really. So I go to sleep at 2 a.m. And then I'll wake up, let's say at like 6 a.m. And what I should do is say, you've only gotten four hours of sleep. You need to just lay down, get your eight, whatever. But I immediately am like, well, if I wake up now, I can play more video games. If I wake up now, I'll finally hit level 15. If I wake up now, my axe skill is going to hit 100 and I'm going to finally get my endurance where it needs to be. Do you hear my dog shaking? So I, so I went to sleep at like 2 a.m. last night. I wake up at 6.37, something like that. And instead of getting my sleep, I was just like, well, let's wake up. Let's hop on the computer immediately. Let's start playing, baby, because I have been so addicted to this new game, but it's an old game. And yeah, I think today's episode is going to have some video games in it. So not like videos of the video games. I'm not doing a let's play. But, you know, if this if your thing is not listening to a guy talk about video games, then, uh, you know, maybe skip 20 minutes from now or something. I don't know. I literally don't know when I'm going to stop. I might be done right now. But if that's not your thing, I get it. Uh, but there's this new game. Oh, that is old coffee. And I'm going to finish the whole cup. And the game is actually very old. When did it come out? I'll tell you right now. You don't care, but I'll t I want to know. Uh, let's see. 2002. This game came out in 2002. That's out nuts. This game is 20 years old. That's cr I didn't realize it was that old. Um, and I know you're dying to know what it is. And it's the Elder Scrolls Three Morrowind. And some of you just shit a brick and said, oh my God, he's playing Marwin. I fucking love Marwin. Oh my God. And most of you just went, who cares? I don't know what that is. My mom's probably listening. She's like, I remember him wasting time playing that when he was 15. Instead of talking to girls and forming permanent relationships, he was doing that. You know, that kind of thing. But um, I love it, dude. And I love it because, well, for numerous reasons. But because I have played it kind of for half of my life, and not consistently, by the way. I take years and years off and then come back to it. I haven't been playing it for 20 years straight. But I kind of get it. Like I have played it so much throughout time, throughout time, that I know so much about the world. It's an open world RPG, very like tabletop, you know, dice rolls are happening off screen to determine if you've hit the creature you're fighting or not, that sort of thing. Like it's, it's not completely old school but it's a nice interim between old school and modern gaming um some people would be completely turned off by pieces of it the combat was dated whatever uh but i'm used to that stuff so what's left over for me to like enjoy is the world and that world is huge there's like real books in the game <laughs> that you can read so i probably read more in this game than i do in real life and i read a lot in real life so because I'm really smart and I'm cool and I like myself and I believe in, in growing your and that growing your brain is important and you can tell that how much I've grown my brain because I say grow your brain um, and so I've been playing that again and I expected to like jump into it for 10 hours something like that and then get bored um, and it's been 
I think it's been another hundred hours. Like I've played it for another hundred hours and it actually might be more than that. And I'm embarrassed. So I'm saying 100. I think it might actually be 200, which is nuts. So, and I've, cause I've done that before. Like I've played the game for extended periods of time before. So it kind of feels like I should have milked it for all it's worth, but it still doesn't feel that way because there's so many different ways that you can approach this game. Because it is, it's one of those, you make a character, you make a hero, um, and then you have certain skills that your character prefers, certain ones that he could grow in, but they're not his favorite, he or she, because you can play a lady. And then there's a bunch of different races. You could be an orc, you could be an elf, you could be a dark elf, you could be a wood elf, you could be a high elf, you could be a, there's not a dwarf. The dwarves went extinct, and they're called the Dwemer, and it's very sad. They did some magic stuff and then they all disappeared before, you know, the history before the game even started. So you don't get to play a dwarf. Okay, you don't get to. But then there's some humans, Imperial, Breton, like there's different times, different times, high, different kinds. So there's a lot of character customization. So what you end up with every time, depending on what you wanted to end up with, is so much different from what you last did. God, you guys are going to hate this episode, but I'm just going to, it's on my mind. I can't not talk about what's on my mind. And um, so like the last character I had was like a stealthy archer, right? Very cool, very powerful, very fast. I got spoiled by how fast he moved. Now my character is an orc that wields two-handed axes and wears not heavy, but medium armor. And, and, then, and he might even leave his shoulders exposed because he cares about that unarmored skill too. Uh, and so he's a lot slower, but he's also, instead of hitting... With an arrow doing a little bit of damage, he's hitting with an axe, doing quite a bit of damage, sometimes knocking his, his opponents down. And then they're on the ground and you're chopping at him with an axe and you can imagine how quickly that fight ends. So, um, but goddamn, this game has really captured me <laughs> again. And that's like, that's why I woke up. I woke up, I'm, I'm trying to get better about where the mic should be, so I really don't know. When I listen back to the recordings, on my end, they always sound quiet. So I, in post, I turn up the volume by a pretty substantial amount. And nobody said you're too loud yet. And I didn't get complaints like that in my old videos and that's what I was doing for them too. So I assume it's okay. Uh, but I, yeah, I really, it's kind of hard to figure out because what works on my end may be too loud or too quiet for you. Uh, and a lot of, you know, what are your speakers set to? Are you wearing headphones? Is, is, does your keyboard have a volume control that's separate from the speakers? All sorts of stuff. So boring, but um, maybe less boring than talking about a video game. I don't know. You can tell how insecure I am about being a gamer. I, I don't think I look, I look like a nice, sexy boy or man. Excuse me. <laughs> I say boy sometimes when I mean man. And, uh, you know, I'm whatever, charming, whatever I am. But I don't feel like I look like a gamer. I think this... Now, a lot of people, like, everyone plays games now. So a, a video gamer looks like everybody. But I think that the cliched, nerdy, like, pale gamer, I don't really fit that dichotomy. And for some reason, I don't know if it's because of that, but I like, when I find somebody that's a kindred spirit and I can really open up about gaming, I like, blah, like it's a flood. But otherwise, I feel like nobody wants to hear about it. Because why would they? Truly, why would they? It's okay. But more than that, there's something for me tie, like, tied to gaming that is, I don't know how to form this sentence. I think that gaming makes you a loser, even though I love it. And I think that way because I have definitely used video games to avoid doing things in my life. You know, like, and I might not have even known what I needed to do, but I was unhappy. And so instead of doing things outside of myself to feel better, I kind of sucked inwards and just played games. And I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that whether it's gaming or exercise. And you could say, well, exercise is better than gaming. I think if you overdo exercise, that's equally as bad. And I think people that are obsessed with exercise are even more annoying than people that are obsessed with games. Except the exception is children that are addicted to their tablets. When you take their tablet away, 
that's the most annoying type of gamer. That's the one of one of my least favorite people is a child for the first hour and a half that you take away their tablet. That window is horrible. I dated a girl who had a when we first started dating her son was 4 and when we broke up he was either 7 or nearly 7 and a struggle throughout that whole relationship was how addicted he was to his tablet and I'm still bitter is not the right word but I still I learned so much from that relationship that when I think back about the lessons the harsh lessons I still get a little angry a little angry at myself that I didn't pick up on things sooner a little frustrated with her because I feel I was mistreated in certain ways I didn't do a perfect job but I'll be honest I did pretty damn good and I tried really hard uh, but her son was uh yeah he really like needed his tablet um and he you know he's one of those kids he wasn't gaming but he was playing he was playing he wasn't gaming but he was gaming he was watching uh youtube and it was frustrating because he was watching youtube as a replacement to good parenting as a replacement to interaction, as a replacement for going outside and doing things that involved supervision. And uh, she was a single mom and she was really struggling. And so that's not her fault that she tried to find different. She tried to make her life comfortable too. And so the tablet probably made it feel like she had some more space. But I don't know if you get to have space when you're parenting a young child. I think when you have a kid and I don't have kids, so what do I know? But I think when you have a kid, you have to know, first of all, that your life is going to change. But you have to accept that you're not going to be living the single life anymore. You, and, if, and it's really gross when people try to. Uh, I'm sure you all know people who had kids and then refused to grow up and their kids suffered for it. And so that's kind of what was happening here. But to give her the benefit of the doubt, I'm going to say it was more so because she was a single mother and struggling to f to know how to parent because it's like not easy with somebody but on your own and, and she didn't have particularly helpful parents you know not even not it's even worse so but we would we worked on taking his tablet away and he would get pale and scream like we were stabbing him not just when we took it but for an hour afterwards and there's there's studies that have been done you can google it right now tablets for kids youtube that kind of thing is like heroin they get addicted to it and they go through withdrawal when you pull the tablet away and that's uh i don't know as much as maybe i should for how much i'm talking about it but it to me it makes sense their brains are like mushy sponges and so they get really wrapped up in whatever they're doing and if whatever they're doing is like bright flashing colors with videos intended to keep a kid's attention permanently and you take that away, yeah, it would be extremely upsetting because their whole world is that tablet in that moment. And it gives them it gives them the same comfort and joy that it gives us when we're binging a TV show, you know? We do that for certain reasons. Like it's one thing to watch a show because you enjoy it. It's another thing to watch five seasons in a row and miss out on three days of your life. And there's, uh, I don't even think there's anything wrong with doing that, but it's okay to do that and also acknowledge like, why, why am I doing this? Why am I spending so much time vegging on the couch watching something? Am I being an active participant in my own life or am I sitting on the sidelines waiting for something to happen to me? So like do both things, binge watch the show, but also be, have some self-awareness not that there's always something causing you to do that, causing you to binge watch a show or whatever. Like maybe it is just a really good show. But in my case, when I'm doing things egregiously, it's typically because I'm avoiding something else. I mean, I could say this podcast I put off recording for a couple hours, no big deal. But like I was nervous about it. I was anxious about starting. I am intimidated by talking for an hour you know it's one thing if there's an audience it's a different thing and i'm not a headliner but it's a different thing if there's nobody you know because i want this to be good i want it to be enjoyable i'm all over the place but they get the same 
they're, they're, they as children have different problems, but I think they're treating the same or similar emotional issues that we're treating when we watch TV for extended periods of time, when we work ourselves to death, you know, 80 hour weeks or whatever. Uh, and so if you take away that tool, you know, that's a tool for them. Um, it's how they're coping with something and they don't have other coping skills. They don't have other defense mechanisms, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's alarming, I think, is the word. It's, I'm fidgety too. I'm so fidgety. It's upsetting. Um, and so because of that, I always, I've all, because of that relationship, I've, I've kind of since then had this bad taste in my mouth when I see kids stuck to their phones or st stuck to their parents' phones. That's even worse, in my opinion. Well, I mean, it's not worse because they shouldn't have a phone at a young age. So maybe it's better that their parents are. But it's like, dude, they'll be like out to lunch and the parents are talking and the kids are just sitting on their phones. And it's like, oh, but what if you guys ate like a family? What if you guys had dialogue? And what if your kids were okay with being bored sometimes? What a fucking concept, dude. I get so angry when I see parents not parenting. Again, not a parent. Why do I care? I don't know. Maybe I think I could do a better job. I really don't know. Max, you don't get it. It's so hard. Sometimes you just need a break. Cool. What did we do until phones were invented? Did we just never get breaks? I can't imagine that kids sitting at the dinner table on technology instead of interacting is good at all. I think the only reason that would happen is because the parents don't want to fucking deal with it. That's it. If your kid has special needs and he only is comfortable when he's on a tablet, that's different. If somebody's autistic or something, and I'm talking out of my ass a little bit, but if, and they need that stuff, and they got their headphones on, whatever it is, great, cool. Otherwise, your kid is acting like he has autism. And there's nothing wrong with having autism, but you shouldn't want it. You shouldn't want to be autistic. And you're creating this socially awkward nightmare of a person treating them like they can't be negotiated with <laughs> that you have to supplicate and bow down before their every command weak parenting is like what's ruining the country and i'm not even a the country screwed kind of guy i don't feel like america's doomed i really don't i think america sucks <laughs> but not as a i'm not like upset about the country i think the politics suck the, the bipartisanship is frustrating Things like that, but I don't think we're doomed. But if I had to pick a thing, in this moment, I can't think of anything else. I'm sure there's other stuff, but basically weak parenting. That a lot of people, well, this generation has lost the ability to tell their kids no and mean it. And, um, you know, dislike the video if you think I'm, I'm a piece of shit for talking about parenting when I don't have kids. Um, but you know, just understand that if you do that, it's because you're deeply insecure about your, in, your ability to parent, you know, and that you probably know I'm right. Just do that. Just dislike the video, but then admit to yourself, oh shoot, I'm not doing a good job. That's because I would rather live my own life than, than work on helping my kid develop a happy existence. Just do that. Just do that for me. Would you? I, it really does drive me crazy, man. Anyways, I was talking about the video game, and I don't need to keep talking about the video game, but I've been spending a lot of time playing it. And, uh, okay, so, and here's maybe what I'm avoiding. I live in a place, and I, I'm sure I've mentioned this, I live in a place where I can't do very much stand-up. Um, if I was maybe a, a more successful stand-up, I could do more, but where I'm at right now, I can't do very much. And for multiple reasons, not all of them are the scene that I'm in, but, but some of it is like, I live very far away from things. Um, you know, an open mic is like two hours one way. It's not, but on some days it is, <laughs> you know, um, I'm lucky cause there's this comedy club that, you know, comedy room, I'll say it's not really a club. 
opened up five minutes for me. That's so awesome, but there's limited spots. So I'm there as often as I can be, but the guy, he's not going to book me every week. You know, he, that's not fair. Even if I do a really good job, he's not going to, how, how are we 20 minutes in already? What is going on? I just lost 10 minutes of my life talking about being pissy at parents. So I oftentimes feel deeply insecure about my future because I don't think I'm getting better at stand up fast enough. I'm not really concerned with my reputation. I'm not that concerned at like getting into all the clubs around the country. I should be, but my main concern is like, I just want to be really fucking good. I want to be undeniably good. I want to be able to go into almost every room and be able to kill or just put on a good show at least because maybe you can't guarantee that you're killing, but I don't know, but I want to know. And right now I'm not good enough to say for sure. So, you know, my dream, yeah, I want to support myself doing stand-up comedy. That's my dream. I want to make $30,000 a year doing stand-up. If I could do that, I would be thrilled. I would love to live at the poverty line and be doing stand-up for a living. That would be so cool. <laughs> that would be, I can't even tell you how happy that would make me. But my actual goal is to do stand-up forever and become really, really good at it. And I say do stand-up forever, not because it's a challenge or something, but because I just love it and it, it makes me happy. And I spent some of the last eight years denying that and trying to find a different way through life and a different path to success that was maybe less scary. Because stand-up is very scary. It's scary to do it. You know, like I'm very much used to performing, so I get a lot less nervous than other people would. Um, like public speaking kind of never really bothered me, but but sure, when there's a couple hundred people and you're, you're not certain about all your material or what you're even gonna say, whatever, that's nerve-wracking. Um, your heart's beating quick. You can feel butterflies in your stomach, you know, but that excitement is kind of also what makes it worth it. It's also kind of what makes it doable because you turn on because of that energy. A, a switch flips and you're on stage and that adrenaline kicks in and you're fucking on and that feels great. And when it doesn't happen, it feels terrible. And that's called bombing. Um, for me, at least, you know, um, Oh my God. And I had to have talked about the horrible bomb I had a few weeks ago, right? If I didn't, all I'm going to say is I was so bad, I'm still feeling it. I'll bomb. I don't even, I can't give you a number, but very rarely will I feel like that was bad. I might say that was bad for me or I didn't do as well as I would have liked, but it still was good. But <laughs> it was so fucking not good. It's unreal. It made me feel like I, it was my first time again. That's how in my head I was. That's how unable to pull anything funny out of my brain I was. It made me feel like a brand new comic. So, what am I talking about? Oh, yeah, so I, um, so I feel bad a lot, you know? That's kind of where the name of this podcast came from, All Moments Eternally Nice. I'm not looking to be joyful 24 seven, but I would love to not feel in my head and upset a lot of the time. And again, it's like, I'm happy. So I say that and I really wanna be careful because I don't want this to be a negative, depressing podcast, at least not every episode. Some of them can be sad, whatever, but <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I don't know, I uh, spend time feeling like my future is out of my hands because of where I live. And that is ex an extremely difficult truth for me to accept. And there's possible ways I could be successful here, like be successful from here. I couldn't just stay where I'm at and only do comedy here. I would have to travel. <clears throat> the step I think would be to, to, I would then would have to care very much about getting into clubs and then I could travel the country, you know, that way. What has worked for me in the past is living somewhere like New York City and doing it many times a day, two, three times a night, six, seven days a week. That helps me get really sharp. Um, I watched some old videos of me when I was doing it so often and I'm like, God damn, I might be wiser. 
I might even be funnier now. And I'm not, this, I get so fucking weird about saying I'm funny too. It's just like, I know what funny is and I don't feel that way. <laughs> but um, I look at those old videos and I'm like, damn, dude, I was so keyed in, keyed in, keyed up, clued in, connected. I don't know, dude. I was so focused. And now when I listen to my sets, I actually am proud. They make me happy. I'm like, fuck, dude, I really said that. That makes me, I'm glad I pieced these things together. And that's a really deep truth. God damn. I was embarrassed to say it, but it still came out. That feels good. Stuff like that. And I didn't have those experiences before. I didn't think, I had done some courageous things on stage. I had like, one thing I think of every now and then is I, I was at a bar doing a show and uh, there were like 10 comics on. All of them bombed. I was last. I got up and instead of doing my material and bombing like they all had, because it just the audience wasn't listening to material. They didn't want material. They wanted crowd interaction. They wanted something exciting. So I opened the front door of the bar and I started doing crowd work with people on the street. And then this really sweet Mexican woman ended up coming in thinking it was an actual television show. I don't know how she thought that, but she did. And came in and sat on the couch and I did an impromptu interview with her. And it was fucking awesome. And it was so funny. Uh, and I'm not saying that. I'm saying, judging by the audience reaction, it was so funny. So, and then she stayed and it was funny because there was a show there after that. And the guy was like, you have to get her out of here. And it's like, no, nah, dude, I don't have to fucking get her out of here. If I get her out of here, there goes half your audience, dummy. You want her here. Also, no, I don't. Also, you get her out of here. I don't care that she's here. I like that she's here. Let her hang out. I don't know what his fucking problem was. Hey, I'm about to put on a show, so get this audience member out. What's She wasn't going to be disruptive, dude. He was just, I don't know if it was racist or what. It wasn't a white guy. That doesn't mean he can't be racist, but it was like, where are you coming from, dude? So I've done courageous things on stage like that, like took a risk, whatever. Lots of them, and those feel good. But now I'm more focused on, I have a narrative, and I really want to get it out, and I want to figure out the funniest way to tell this piece of my life. And I didn't used to look at it like that. I just looked at it like, let's just go be silly and as witty as we possibly can. And I don't know if that's a better way to look at it or not. I don't feel as sharp as I used to feel. And I wish I did, but I don't, whatever. Maybe I will later. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm happy with the change. I'm going to burp. Or am I? Huh? No, I'm not. I'm happy with the change between me then and me now. But to be honest, I'm just realizing this. I don't know which version of me I would pick if I had to choose. I'm hopeful that in both cases, if I was feeling sharp and witty, I could find this narrative driven max again and i'm hopeful that this narrative driven max that i feel i am right now can also find that sharpness that i had before that's probably the truth and also what's probably most true is that i'm just being extremely self-critical and feeling horrible about things that i should actually feel okay about it's warm in here i'm getting heated and uh so so I'm thinking about moving. I don't know if I've said that or not. I don't, I really, we're like eight episodes in and I don't know what I've said, um, which is really bad. Maybe I should write it down. No, why would I do that? What am I gonna read the whole notebook every time I talk? So I'm thinking about moving to a place where I can do it regularly. I mean, I'm doing it regularly, but I mean like every day. Um, and I don't care if it's five days a week, whatever. I don't really care if it's four days a week, as long as it's multiple times in those, at night for those four days, whatever. And I've got a friend that's a very, very good friend. He's not a comic. He's a funny guy and he loves comedy, but he's not a comic himself. And he is so supportive and such a fan. And he was a fan before I did stand up and he's a fan now. Um, and he really believes in me. He, I wish I believed in me as much as he believes in me. I would feel, I think then I would change the name of this podcast to 
all moments eternally joyful. Amej, which is my uncle's name, Amej. Uh, we're a bunch of Arabs. So I, he says that I don't need it. He th says that, uh, for, I don't think he wants me to move. I'll say that. He lives three minutes from me. And I live three minutes from him. That's how that works. So I think that's part of it. But I don't think that's the, the main part. He thinks that I don't need those reps. He thinks I'm good enough right now to achieve whatever I want to achieve. Beg to differ. Beg to differ. Big beg. But I see where he's coming from. And he's talking about like natural ability, whatever. But he sees me at my most comfortable. He sees me with a friend I, I dearly love and trust completely. And I'm relaxed and I'm able to just fully be myself. And so the goal on stage is to emulate that, you know, it might be an exaggerated form of yourself, whatever, but like, really you want to, I don't know why I act like I don't know. Sometimes I've done stand up for a while. I can say at least a few things. I, um, you want to treat the audience, you want to hang out with the audience like they're your friends, but they don't get to talk back. You know, you want to treat them in that jovial, fun, comfortable way, depending on who you are, depending on how you treat your friends, whatever your persona on stage might be different. But that comfortability is, I think, necessary to be really funny on stage. It helps them relax. It helps you find the funny, all that. And uh, philosophizing about comedy is a little gross. I don't know. I mean, it's super fun to do it when you're around other comedians, but maybe just talking into a camera doesn't feel great. I don't know. But um, oh. so I'm thinking about moving because, well, let me finish the one thought. He doesn't think I need to move because he thinks that I can do it from here with what I've got available to me and with the talents that I already have. And I think that I need to go somewhere where I can do it regularly because I'm not going to find that comfort level that I need to be myself fully on stage. Um, and I'll be honest, this podcast has been helpful already. I mean, just talking for an hour is, is nice. Um, I, think it's, I think it has helped me on stage even. Because um, here I, ha I can't, I mean, I'm fine with dead silence. Like, you know, I'm not going to force... I'm not going to talk because I'm afraid of silence if the moment calls for quiet. But, you know, here I have to keep thinking of things to say. And I want them to be real. And I want them to be funny, but that's not really my first goal with this podcast. Maybe it will be eventually. You know, but right now I feel like we're still setting the foundation. And the foundation is me. And that feels very egotistical and I don't like that. But what else would it be? It's not a themed podcast. We're not talking about murder mysteries. Uh, it's not um, a man on the street show where I'm interviewing people about what their favorite shoes are. You know, it's me talking about my life, talking about trying to be happy, talking about pursuing stand-up as a career. So what else could I possibly talk about? And if I'm not feeling funny, fuck you. I'm not going to be funny. I'm not going to force it. You know, old Max would have forced it. Old Max would have fought to twist himself into a mania so he could be funny at all times and that's impossible to be manic all the time so I would crash and uh, oops I just opened something on accident I would crash and then I would get really depressed because of course because you can't be one way all the time you have to be all the things that you're feeling that you're going through um, but that wasn't obvious to me back then like it is now Back then, I thought the only thing that mattered was being funny. And I still feel that way sometimes. And that makes how I feel right now difficult. Because like I said, I don't feel as sharp as I used to. I feel more thoughtful. But I don't feel as funny. And I don't, certainly don't feel funnier. So, but it has to be better, right? It has to be better to be this way. I mean, it, dude, if you tell me that it's only possible to be to be successful as a standard comedian if you're that sick in the head then I guess I'm just fucked because I don't think I can will myself into being that mentally ill again 
my perspectives were so skewed that I wasn't even aware of how broken I was. I had no idea how much of my life I was repressing and not dealing with. I just thought, well, I'm just a funny machine and that's what I do. And when the machine's not working right, I should just shut myself off because what's the point anyways? And that's, um, that's pretty sad. Not like you should feel bad for me, but I mean, like, that's kind of pathetic. Um, hold on. I need a sip of water. That coffee is gross. Not in my mouth and my tummy. Do you ever drink stuff that's like, we'll just say coffee. I don't know what I'm saying. Stuff. And it sits in your stomach weird. Like it's somehow acidifying your stomach. So now everything burns. Maybe that's just me. Stand up lately has been good though. I will say <laughs> since that bomb. Um, I mean, and really everything before that bomb was good and everything after has been good. And actually everything after has been really good because some stuff clicked together on stage uh, that I wasn't sure how to, it would work and it all came together. It's not done by any means. Like I still need a lot more jokes in it, but um, I found the end. And when you find the end, it well, when I find the end, it becomes a lot easier to find the beginning. And to me, eh, I mean, the end needs to be fun. In my opinion, needs to be the funniest part of the thing, or it needs to wrap it all up. It needs to do something bigger than the sum is greater than the whole of its. What the fuck? The sum, the greater, the whole of the parts are nicer than the amount of them. What? The sum is greater than the, what is it? <laughs> you guys are screaming this at me right now. The sum is greater than the parts. What? Oh God, what if the sum is greater than the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Oh shit. Wow, I couldn't think of that. Remember that uh, time I said I don't feel as clever and witty as I used to? <laughs> Whatever could I be referring to? So, yeah. Like, the end needs to do something for it to be interesting, in my opinion. I think you can tell time in comedy by, oftentimes, there's other ways, but, like, the depth of the material. And not even that it's, like, emotional, but, like, it should be multi-layered. It shouldn't just be, and there you go. You know, it shouldn't just be a fart joke. It should be a fart joke that's actually a metaphor about your dad's farts. Or something, you know, it's whatever. Uh, so, it. I had that. I had that moment on stage that I really love, where I was talking. I was. I had a bunch of individual things that were about the same topic, and then I found the through line, and then I found the end. And the end was a line that I had as a standalone. Um, it's about a, the whole, the end of the bit is about a boxing match I had with a corrections officer and it, I wasn't in prison boxing, a corrections officer. I am a boxer. I was in boxing class, not class really. I do one-on-one -on -one sessions did. I'm not doing that shit anymore. I don't know, but I'll still call myself a boxer, even though I suck. Um, and my coach had me fight a female and that's fine. It's a sp friendly sparring match. Who cares? Um, I mean, I care a little bit. Please don't make me fight a female. That's horrible. I can't win. What are you going to do? Win? So, and then I, I so <clears throat> that's where the joke ends. There's, I'm not doing the joke. I'm not going to tell you the jokes, but uh, it wraps up there and it wraps up very nicely. But that just existed on its own for a long time. A line that I have about that sparring match with the corrections officer. And, uh, and then I realized like, oh, this standalone line that I've had for however many months now is actually the end of this all of this stuff it's actually the last joke i'll tell when i've gone through all this material and again the camera reverses things so really i should be going it's it's the end and then when i do all this stuff then it's here okay my dog's barking let me guess you're gonna come right back in I'll probably have to let her back in. But the good thing about a podcast is that, you know, when I go to let my dog out, you guys can light a cigarette. You can get a drink from downstairs. You can do what you need to do. 
So I do like that. I like that I can just look stuff up. I've said it before, but like YouTube was very methodical. Um, it also at times felt disingenuous, but more than anything, it felt scripted. Even when it wasn't scripted, which it often wasn't for me, I liked just talking kind of like this. But I would have a theme, or I would have a you know a real topic. But um, this is—it's just nice to just feel like it's a real conversation, a rhetorical one, but a conversation nonetheless. I need to get a haircut. I either need to get a haircut or I need to commit. I know, great visual bits. Let's talk about your hair on this audio medium. Uh, I need to get a haircut or I need to admit that I'm going to look bushly and ugly pretty soon and just be okay with it. I like the beard length that it is. For those of you just listening, it's about two, three inches, like something else. And, uh, my, and my hair is, I don't know, it's too long. And I get a rat tail in the back when it gets long. And it's like, I don't know. The option is have a rat tail on the back or cut my own hair and look like Frankenstein. So I stick with what I got. Uh, and I don't like haircuts. I do not like haircuts. And I s don't like scissors by my face. Um, and I don't like strangers talking to me. And I don't like feeling restricted and confined. Let's say uh, in a chair with a tarp draped over me tied around my neck. I don't like any of those things. And uh, yeah, I really hate feeling confined. I can't wear my winter coat in my truck. Since I was incarcerated, I have these really weird, can't feel trapped feelings. Not even like claustro claustrophobia, claustroph dude, I'm so dumb today. Claustrophobia, like, uh, I don't like to feel pressure on me. So if she wants in, she wants in. Go light that cigarette. Took, uh, I took Nolly to the vet. Hi, puppy. I took Nolly to the vet the other day. So I took, we were on a walk and she peed and I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. She peed minimum 15 times, minimum. So I'm like, okay, she has to have a urinary tract infection. There's gotta be something going on, UTI or otherwise. Are we talking yeast? What are we talking, doc? So I took her in. And she had had a rash on her stomach. She's got a tooth that had looked chipped and it was starting to turn brown. I was like, you know what? It's going to be good to get her a checkup anyways. And you know the vet's expensive. If you got pets, you know it's pricey. So I was nervous about that. I'm like, you got to make sure it's worth it. But I love her. And if she's in any type of pain, of course, I wanted to get better. I, I'm not going to let her sit in pain so I can save a few hundred dollars. That's crazy to me. That's just how I'm wired. I know some people think of dogs differently than than other living like people. I don't know. I don't. I mean, I do. They're dogs. I don't think they're human or anything like that. But if an animal's suffering, I want to fix it. I don't feel less inclined to fix it because they're an animal instead of a human and we're animals. But you know what I'm saying? And actually, I would argue that I feel more inclined to help an animal than a human because oftentimes I feel like humans should just help themselves and they're not. And I feel like a lot of times problems that we have aren't because the problems are unsolvable, but because we're not solving them. That's what I think. But, and it's not like they're easy to solve. And there's a lot of things in the way. You might not know what the solution is. You might have a bunch of bullshit in your own, you know, personality, your own behaviors that are preventing you from getting to that solution. Like we talked about the playing video games instead of recording the podcast. You know, there's a lot of things that can be in the way, but a dog doesn't know that. A dog doesn't realize that if I don't stop licking this paw, it's never going to heal. You know, they just are dogs, so they just do what dogs do. So I wanted to make sure that it was worth it before I went in. And it turns out this might have been a little preemptive. Um, I'm not like, what would the word be if you're hypochondriacal, but for another thing, for a living thing that's not you? I don't know, but I'm not a hypochondriac for my dog. Like I don't think she's sick all the time. Um, and if I do think she's sick and it's not real bad, I think like, well, she may have eaten something weird like grass or whatever, and maybe that's making her sick. So wanted to make sure it's worth it. Turned out to be a little preemptive. 
The only thing that was an issue at all was her stomach rash is like a secondary infection. And I don't know what that means. I don't know what a secondary infection is. Secondary infection sounds like an infection to me, which sounds like a primary infection. I don't know if that means there's an infection somewhere else causing an infection here. If that's the case, that sounds way worse <laughs> that you have an infection so bad somewhere else that it's causing infections in other places. I don't think that's it because I think he would have told me Ooh, the other place that it was infected <laughs> and he just mentioned her stomach. So I think maybe it means it's an infection caused by... No, that doesn't mean an infection caused by something else. Infections are always caused by something else, like a cut. So the infection would be secondary to the cut. Dude, I don't know what it means. And I should have asked, but dude, I don't know what it means. I got no clue. So he gave me a spray for her belly, her tooth. Turns out she was just the way that her teeth came into her face. Uh, it, it, you know, her, when her teeth closed, the top one would scrape against the bottom one and eventually she just scraped it all the way. So not great. Not an emergency. Tooth doesn't need removed. You all good puppy. And um, what was the other thing? Rash. Oh, the peeing. I actually, dude, I was so proud of myself there that when I called to schedule the appointment, they're like, okay, now, if you can, get some of her pee for us. Which, hey, always an exciting request. Get something's pee for us. How often do you get to do that? How many times in your life have you had to get pee from another living thing and then bring it to a different person. It's a pretty unique task. Now, something can't be pretty unique. It's either unique or it's not, but I'm going to use pretty unique because I've only done it a couple times. And actually, I don't think I've ever done it. And ooh, no, nope, I might have taken my cat to that once and had to bring in litter that had been peed on. Maybe. But the lady I was speaking to said, if you can get some of her pee pee for us, that would be nice, nice. So I, uh, Nice, nice. Gross. So I uh, <laughs> was like, okay, lady, sure, I'll get her pee for you. This coffee's gross. Yeah, no problem. I'll just cut my hands under her and walk around all day waiting for a dribble. And at this point, she had squatted 15 times without peeing, like, at all. So I figured, all right, this is going to be impossible. Even if I could do that, she's not going to be able to pee. 30 minutes later, she has to go outside. She goes outside. I grab a Ziploc bag because, of course, I'm not just going to use my hands. If only for the fact that it would run between my fingers and be a complete waste by the time I got to the vet. She squats. I run up to her with the Ziploc bag like a catch-all right under her dog vagina. And it grossed me out. The vagina and the pee. And it goes right in. And it's a lot. She was like, not Nolly, but the vet lady was like, we just need a couple teaspoons. I got ladles full. I got a whole Tupperware container. I got gallons. I got some stored for the apocalypse. We'll never need water. There was so much. I don't know why she had to pee all of a sudden, but it worked out great. So we were able to take that to the vet. They tested it. There's nothing wrong. I don't know why she just peed 15 times that day. She just felt like it, I guess. I didn't know that dogs could feel like that. I didn't realize the dogs could say, you know what I'd like? I would like to squat above 10 times today. I would like to do that. Most of the time when she squats to pee, she looks uncomfortable. She's got really strong hind legs. She's a pit bull, so they're really big and muscular. So when she squats, they kind of like press against, you know, like the leg bends and the muscles kind of push outwards and it presses against itself. So it looks uncomfortable. It just looks like it's making her little dog knees, whatever they are, hurt. It doesn't look good, but she chose to do it many, many times, I guess, just because. Taco Bell sounds so good right now. I was about to say I try not to eat fast food, but that's a lie. I've lost 60 pounds somehow. I was at 305, and I'm now 240-something. And basically, I've just eaten less food. But none of it is healthy. <laughs> I don't binge on sweet foods anymore. I, okay, this is the best my food has been in my whole life. I have definitely struggled with binge eating. I have definitely struggled with night eating syndrome. I have definitely struggled with um, body dysmorphia. Eating to feel a certain way. Completely comatose if I can. I mean, really. I, when I lived in New York, I would order a pizza. I would go out and get ice cream. Back in time for the pizza. But before that pizza got delivered, I would order more food. To have after, so I'd eat the pizza, eat the ice cream, have that more food delivered right in time, 
and then order dessert. I would have four, like four deliveries, three deliveries in a pickup, whatever, of and t- meals for a family. <laughs> Each one was a meal for a family, and I was like, I'll be having that, please. Alone in my bed. I would have my laptop on my lap, watching YouTube, what do you know? <laughs> and uh, binging, like eating pizza after pizza, pints and pints of ice cream, ordering shit from uh, bakeries, which in New- I mean, there's just, the food in New York was crazy. I've heard it's gotten worse, but I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I've heard that the diners don't stay open late anymore, which that's a bummer because it was always fun to like do open mics or whatever and then go and hang out at a diner or at least go get like late night pizza with somebody that was cool. But um, yeah, it, uh, it's just never, I've never needed to eat less than I do now. And I've never felt annoyed by having to eat. And now I feel annoyed. I'm like, fuck, I have to stop what I'm doing to go make food, to go eat the food. Like, takes forever. It's annoying. I'm not particularly enjoying it. So the only food that I really enjoy, a little sip of water here. That's not me saying that I enjoy the water. I do enjoy water, but that's not what I'm, the food is not the water. A little food that I do enjoy is the stuff that's been mechanically processed and genetically engineered to make my taste buds come every, taste buds come? Taste buds come. It was already a gross sentence. Worse because I had to repeat it three times because of my stupid, stupid mouth. And uh, yeah, so stuff like Taco Bell where it's like, you know, it's turned up to 11. There's chemicals in it that make you physically crave the food. I don't care about any of that. I'm eating so little at this point. I'm like, Max, as long as you eat, that's good. And the taco meat, the beef taco meat. I've heard it's 4% better than dog food. And apparently that's all the percentage you need to be delicious. But the chicken chalupa supremes, before we go there, it's so expensive. Fast food is so expensive now. Steak and Shake is a place where I live. I know there's one in New York. I don't know where Steak and Shake is in the country. It's a really good burger and shake place. It used to be very expensive because it's like all made to order. It's it's steps above McDonald's and Burger King, like st- big steps above Uh And now it is cheaper than Taco Bell. Their prices didn't change. Taco Bell has like tripled their prices. They had these, uh, I don't know, what did they call them? They like, I don't know, they were like classy tacos. They were basically just their, not basically, literally just their regular tacos with tomato and lettuce. Like more lettuce and tomato. I think there's already tomato and lettuce on. I don't know, that was it. There was no difference. And it came in a container like you would get at Chipotle or Qdoba. So I think they were trying to trick us that way into thinking it was better than it was. And it was four tacos and it was like 20 some dollars, dude. It was insane. You used to be able to get tacos for 99 cents or less. I don't even remember. Taco Bell was, it prided itself on being so disgustingly cheap that you could spend $20 there and leave with a hundred pounds of food. And, and now it is, I might as well, and I'm not even kidding. I might as well go get some carry out at an authentic Mexican restaurant. So that's what I've started to do. There's a, my mouth is watering. It did this the last episode too. I started talking about food and I immediately ordered pizza after the last episode. Um, uh, so I've started to uh, just go to those places. Instead, there's a place a couple minutes from my house. There's a place five minutes from my house. The place five minutes is better, but sometimes three minutes is too much. So I go to the two minute place. The place five minutes away is so authentic. It's unreal. And it's cheaper than Taco Bell. But the mind craves what the mouth wants, whatever. The body needs what it needs. Sometimes you just want Taco Bell, man. Said this before, you go to Wendy's when you want a cheeseburger. I know Wendy's isn't international, sorry. You go to Wendy's when you want a cheeseburger. You go to McDonald's when you want a McDonald's cheeseburger. McDonald's. Nah, and what I'm saying is you can get a burger at a really nice steakhouse and it's a fucking insanely good burger. It's so good. It's the best you've ever had. But that burger is not going to scratch the itch when you want a Big Mac. Sometimes you just want to treat yourself like shit <laughs> and you just want to have horrible, horrible food that you know is horrible food, but it's what you want. What you, what, you, what you want. Like if I wanted McDonald's fries 
it would be tough to go to the store and buy fries that were going to hit that for me. Even though it's just potatoes and oil and salt, you know what I'm talking about. You know what McDonald's does with their potatoes. Just kidding, you don't, and I don't know either because it's magic. I don't know how they make them that good. I don't know if it's because they're skinny. My mouth is watering. I don't know. Stomach hurts, and I don't like it. That's a thing, too. It's a bit annoying. I know I need to eat because my stomach is so empty that it starts to hurt. And I'm not starving myself, guys. I'm not. I'm eating thousands of calories a day. I'm good. But, uh, yeah, and that bothers me. It's like, can I just decide when I eat? Can I just acknowledge I'm hungry? There's plenty of food around. We're going to be fine body, so stop freaking out. I'll eat in a little bit and then shut that off. That would be nice. But the body is like, I live in this um, state of depravity where I think they'll, they'll, they'll no, not depravity. I'm afraid I'll be I'll deprived. What's it called? A scarcity mindset. Famine mindset? Scarcity mindset. Something like that. Uh, and so when I get hungry, there's like some amount of anxiety in my body like, oh, but what if we never eat again? And that's probably everybody feels that because that helped us live when food was scarce. If you're not motivated to go hunt and forage when you're hungry, you're probably just going to starve to death. So it makes sense, but it's obnoxious in 2023 when my fridge is 10 feet from me right now, full of delicious food, and my body is treating it like I need to go fashion a spear out of a broom and go hunting in my neighborhood. It's obnoxious. I actually saw 10 deer this morning, and I don't mean two and three at a time and I counted them. I mean, I saw 10 deer standing in a baseball field. So I guess they're getting a whole team together. And that's, I mean, what? Am I supposed to go hunting? Is that what you want? That's what you're acting like. You're acting like I'm so hungry that I need to go buy a gun just for those deer. No big deal. But those deers were, uh, deers, hello. Those deer were amazing, by the way. That was so cool. The most I've ever seen was probably four, five at a time. 10 is insane. It was a herd of deer. Uh, there's probably even a name for that. It was crazy. They were so skittish too. I didn't see a single male among them, which was weird. And I checked for peepees. I looked for dongers and I didn't see a single one. I know you can check for antlers, but that's not even a guarantee. I want to see balls. So that was so cool. But what, yeah. I'm surprised my mouth didn't start watering when I saw them. It's just, it's nonstop. And it drives me, it really drives me crazy because it's like, God, dude, we're, it's okay. I hate those compulsions. And I know it's food, like food, shelter, water. These aren't exactly compulsions, but I don't like feeling compelled by something out of my control to do something. I don't want to move because I feel like there's not enough stand-up to do here. I don't want to do that. Oh, fuck. You know what? I think I have a show tomorrow night. <laughs> and I'm so glad I remembered right now because I was about to forget. Oh, shit. When is this? When is this? What is this? What the fuck is this? I'll check it later. Um. Hey, is the show tomorrow? Question mark. Normally there's a group here on Facebook, but I'm not part of it this time. Sorry I'm so bad with social media. Please don't be mad. Um, I swear it's tomorrow. It's that storyteller show. It's almost always on the 20 something -th. So, um, we'll wrap it up, guys. Uh, you know, I'm just saying... I don't like being compelled, and right now I feel like I'm being pulled in multiple directions. One, to eat, but more than that, you know, I feel like there's things outside of my control that are telling me I have to leave, I have to move, and I don't want to because I live close to my, oops, sorry, camera. I live close to my parents. I love them very much. I don't want to move away from them. I told you I was going to burp, and um, I like every, I'm close to that friend I mentioned. I like everything in this area except for the stand up and how far I have to drive to do it. That's a bummer. So we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll find a solution, you know, but, uh, you guys are the best. Thank you for listening. If you made it this far, that's incredible. And you're the, you're awesome. So, uh, take care of yourselves. Have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for watching the all men. Bye.